Because anthropology is a study of what it means to be human, when we think about this question of you know, what makes us human, what makes us different from other animals, other creatures that live on the planet, we need to consider the two components that we have to being human. We are both biological creatures and we're also cultural creatures. And these two elements work together to create an incredible diversity of not only cultures, but also physical variation around the planet. One of the things, though, that tends to happen, we can see it happening in the past, we can see it happening in the world we live in today, is that we sometimes confuse the biological and the cultural. Uh, so sometimes we think that certain elements of our life are rooted in biology or that things are biologically true about humans. But when we start to tease them apart a little bit more, we can start to see that while there may be some biological aspects to some of these things that we believe to be very true, there's a lot that's also cultural. Culture builds on our biology and it tells us what to do with our biology. It also tells us what to think about our biology. So the power of anthropology lies in one part in being able to uh, disentangle the cultural and the biological to get to the root of what some of these aspects of humanity are. One example of a topic where we can see the biological and the cultural confused in that way is this concept of race. Race is something that uh, it exists as a very powerful force in the world today. We think about race in some very concrete terms. And we think about it in a very biological sense. So I want to spend this video looking at how we understand diversity, how we understand how humans and other animals are categorized, how diversity is generated biologically, and then how this relates to the concept of race when we're talking about humans. Now to do this, we first have to go back a little bit to biology and talk about the classification systems that we use to understand the natural world. So this is, uh, this is what we call a taxonomy. A taxonomy is simply a classification system that organizes similar things into groups. There are many different types of taxonomies and over the last hundreds of years many different individuals have proposed various classification systems. In biology the taxonomy that we use is referred to as the Linnaean taxonomy. And it's named after this guy, Carl Linnaeus, who was a botanist and a zoologist living and working in the 1700s. When Carl Linnaeus set up his taxonomic system, he considered the diversity of species of both plants and animals that he observed uh, during his lifetime and based on drawings from people who had traveled throughout the world. Then, based on the physical characteristics of those plants and animals, he sorted them into groups. And these were nested groups, meaning that the further you go down this line, the smaller and smaller your groupings end up being. So, for example, in this particular element of a taxonomic system, kingdom. The kingdom here is Animalia. So this particular kingdom encompasses all of the animals that are alive today. As we go further and further down, we get more specific. Uh, so primates is a smaller subset of the animal kingdom. Primates include monkeys, apes, and humans. As we go further down this line, we finally get to genus and then species. Genus Homo, species Sapiens. This is us, humans. So we are part of this nested taxonomic system. We can create our own taxonomy, um, just a you know sort of casual taxonomy, and look at how these types of groupings are created. So here we have six different living things, a cat, a dog, a horse, an iguana, a rose, and a palm tree. And what we're going to do, we'll start over here with the cat, and we can just come up with a number of other animals that look similar to cats. So we have perhaps a lion, tiger, a leopard, and a cheetah. All of these animals have things in common physically. Uh, they all walk on four legs, they all have fur, they all eat meat, and they all are more similar to each other than they appear to be similar to any of these other groups. So we're going to group them together here in a group that we can call the felines. With our next group, dog, 
We can think of other animals that are similar to a dog, like a fox, a hyena, a wolf, and a coyote. We can group these under the heading of canines. And we can see that hyenas and wolves and coyotes and foxes are all more similar to dogs than any one of them are to cats or lions or tigers or leopards or cheetahs. So these are two distinct groups. Anyone within the group is more similar to those outside of the group. If we move on down the line, a horse is similar to a donkey, a zebra, and a mule. And we can call these equines. Further down, we have the iguana, a type of lizard. So we might say an anaconda is similar to an iguana, a rattlesnake, a turtle, a Komodo dragon. We can group these all and call them reptiles. Next, we have a rose, which is a flower. So we also have sunflower, lily, orchid, and daffodil. All of these we can group under the heading of flowering plants. And then finally, the palm tree on our far right side here. Other similar um, species might be rubber trees, pine trees, oak trees, and maple trees. We can group those all together as trees. So now we have each of our sets of creatures grouped into these larger categories of trees, flowers, reptiles, equines, canines, and felines. But we can combine these to create even larger groups. So let's start back over here on the right side. Flowers and trees, we can say, are more similar to each other than either one of them is to reptiles or equines or canines or felines. Because flowers and trees have something in common. They're both types of plants. Coming back over to this side, there are some groups that are more similar than others. So to my eye, the thing that stands out most are felines and canines. Now, they have things in common, like they all they have four legs, they have fur, um, so do equines. But what separates the felines and the canines from the equines is that felines and canines eat meat. They're carnivores. So we can group these two together into this larger grouping of carnivores. We can take this a step further and say, all right, what is this carnivore group most similar to? And I would see them as being most similar to the equines, because again, we're talking about animals with four legs. We're talking about animals with fur. We're talking about animals that give birth to live young. And so we might refer to these as mammals. Now reptiles, our last group remaining here. We can ask which group are reptiles more closely related to, or which similarities do we see most closely? Are reptiles more similar to plants, or are they more similar to mammals? I see, I see them as being more similar to mammals. So we would group them here as animals. And now, from our individual groups of animals, we've managed to cluster them according to similarity in these larger and larger groups, from all these individuals into carnivores, mammals, and then ultimately animals, and plants over here. So we now have a taxonomic system which includes plants and animals. And we can continue adding to this. We can put cows and uh, fish and dolphins. And over here we can put in uh, maybe bacteria and fungi. We can put a lot of stuff into this taxonomy, but it's all about grouping things according to similarity. That's exactly what the Linnaean taxonomy does. At the lowest order here, or the, the most specific um, end of this taxonomy, we have the genus and species. And every distinct species goes by both names, the genus name and the species name. So we, for example, are homo sapiens. We don't refer to ourselves just as sapiens. This practice of giving things two names is referred to as binomial nomenclature, which is a very complicated way of saying a two-name naming system. Okay, so every species has two names. And this species is the smallest taxonomic unit, and a species we can define as a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So that means any male and any female within that group can reproduce and have a baby that can go on to have its own babies. There are two main types of species that we can see existing in the world, specialized and generalized species. Specialized species are those that live in a relatively small geographic area, and they are very, very highly adapted to that specific environment. An example of a specialized species would be the koala here. Koalas live just in eastern Australia, 
And that's because koalas do one very particular thing. They eat eucalyptus leaves. And this, it shouldn't be a surprise, is where eucalyptus leaves are concentrated. So because koalas eat this one type of food that only exists here, they will remain constrained within this geographic region. So we don't ever have to fear that koalas are going to invade North America, because as long as their food is here, they will continue doing their very specially adapted thing in this place. Now because of their small geographic range, members of specialized species also tend to have pretty similar physical characteristics. So most koalas look pretty much identical. The opposite of a specialized species would be a generalized species. A generalized species inhabits a wide geographic range because it's able to adapt to lots of different environmental niches, lots of different environmental habitats. So a great example of a generalized species is our friend the raccoon here. Raccoons live all over North America. We can find them on the East Coast, on the West Coast, in Canada, and all the way down to Panama. And that's because raccoons can eat anything. Raccoons can live out in the middle of the country and do very well eating fruits and nuts and insects, but they can also live right here in New York City. And they do very well here because they like to eat the things that we throw away. So raccoons are very adaptable to lots of different environments. We also tend to see that generalized species have more physical variability between uh, the places where they live. So we might expect that Canadian raccoons look a little bit different than Nicaraguan raccoons, just because they're so far apart, so there are going to be some differences from place to place. The question we can then ask is, what are we? What are humans? Are we specialized or are we generalized? The obvious answer to this question is that we are generalized because we know that humans live absolutely everywhere, right? We're all over the planet. We eat many different types of foods. We can adapt to all of these different environments. And we have this physical variation within our species. So yes, in that sense, we are very generalized. However, I want to sort of modify this answer and say that we are in fact a specialized generalist. Meaning, yes, we can live anywhere, we can adapt to any environment, but we can only do that because we have one very specialized adaptation, and that is culture. Culture makes it possible for us to live everywhere. Culture makes it possible for us to adapt to all these different environments. Culture makes it possible for us to eat all of the different types of food that we eat. Because culture gives us things like farming. Without farming, we would not have food to feed everyone on the planet today. So farming is a cultural, uh, a cultural adaptation, and that is because of that very specialized adaptation of culture. Clothing as well. Clothing is absolutely necessary for many humans to live in many parts of the world. Without clothing, we would not be able to live in New York City in the winter. It's too cold for us as upright, naked apes. So without this cultural adaptation of clothing, we'd be done. So we are both specialized and we are generalized. And it's important that we remember both of those aspects of our distribution. Now, how do we become a species or how does a group of animals become a species? As I mentioned a minute ago, all males and all females within that group must be able to interbreed. Okay, so you have to have all females and all males being able to produce these viable offspring, babies who can have babies. Within a group of individuals who we consider to be the same species, they often cluster into what we call breeding populations. And breeding populations are just geographically uh, discrete in, uh, groups of individuals who tend to reproduce with each other. Maybe it's best if we look at an example of this. So most animals and humans cluster into these breeding populations. Here we have a map of North America. And if we think back to this example of raccoons, we know that we have raccoons in New York. And there are also raccoons all over North America. So each one of these X's represents some sort of population of raccoons. Now, all of these populations of raccoons break down into breeding populations. And that's what this red circle represents. It means that within New York, Raccoons that live here are more likely to reproduce with raccoons in a similar geographic region. They're more likely to reproduce with individuals who are closer to them. 
And the same is true of humans. It's easier for us to have babies with people that we are living next to than with people who are living on the other side of the planet. So we have all of these raccoons all over North America, but within that, they are in these breeding populations where it's more likely that you'll reproduce with someone in that group than someone far away. These breeding populations, though, do overlap. They butt up against each other. And so there will be some raccoons on these edges of the breeding populations that actually breed with each other. We call this gene flow. When there's genes from this breeding population moving into genes of this breeding population. And that gene flow is important because it keeps all of these raccoons existing as the same species. Okay, so within this large population, breeding populations exist, but there is always going to be gene flow. Now, what happens if there's a massive earthquake and suddenly North America is split in half? We've got these breeding populations of raccoons over here and breeding populations of raccoons on this side. This is a divide that because of this natural disaster, these groups of raccoons are not able to cross. What we're going to see is that these raccoons over here will continue breeding with each other. These raccoons over here will continue breeding with each other. But if we keep these two groups separated for a long enough period of time, physical differences will accumulate such that West Coast raccoons will start to look a bit different from our East Coast raccoons. If we keep these two groups separated for a long enough period of time, and we're talking generally millions of years, these two groups will become different enough physically that they will not be able to come back together and reproduce if they were ever able to sort of bridge that divide between them. When this happens, when you have one group that is forced apart and they stay separated long enough, sometimes those can result in enough physical differences that we actually then recognize them as two different species. And this is how species are created, when one group splits into two. If, however, the two groups are separated for a significant enough period of time for physical changes to occur, but not a long enough period of time for them to become so different that they're unable to reproduce if they ever come back together, then we talk about the creation of subspecies. So subspecies are just groups within a single species who can still mix their genes, but just haven't perhaps, or haven't mixed their genes as much because of some sort of geographic isolation. And so there might be physical differences, even though they share the same general genetic component. In biology, we refer to these as subspecies. We can look at breeds of dogs as subspecies, perhaps. Another term that's used for subspecies is races. And that's a word certainly that should be familiar to us if we're talking about humans. So now let's take it back to Carl Linnaeus. In his taxonomy that he was developing in the 18th century, Carl Linnaeus recognized four races or four subspecies of humans. He said there were Americans, who would be Native Americans, Europeans, Asians, and Africans. Okay, he divided all humans into those four groups. Now because a taxonomic system is meant to reflect the relatedness of groups, these four races or subspecies of humans were meant to reflect that common descent or that relatedness. So that would mean that within the American subspecies, anyone who's a member of that group is more closely related to all those other members of that group than they are to anyone else. Okay, well that makes some sense. It would make sense that Native Americans are more closely related to Native Americans than they are to Africans or Europeans or Asians. However, the characteristics that were used to divide humans into these races are a bit problematic because remember a taxonomy is developed on the basis of physical similarity. And so we can then look at the characteristics that have been typically used to divide humans into racial groupings. These are things like skin color most commonly, but also stature, facial characteristics, hair texture, uh, eye color, all of these physical characteristics have been used at one point or another to say this is one race of people, 
and this is another race of people. And again, it means that people with the same characteristic should be more closely related to each other than they are to everyone else. When we look at this on a practical level, on a logical level, uh, taking, for example, skin color, because skin color is the physical characteristic that most often is used in racial groupings. We can see in this map of ancestral skin color that there are some pretty clear geographic patterns showing up. What we see is that the darkest skin tones in ancestral populations tend to exist right around the equator, right? So here in Africa, but then also um, in this area of the Middle East, in India, and into Indonesia, and here in South America as well. These all cluster around the equator. And that's because darker skin tones, or skin tones in general, are produced by melanin in our skin. Populations who have enriched melanin have an advantage in this particular environment, because along the equator is a part of the Earth where there is the highest amount of UV radiation. And UV radiation uh, can be damaging to an individual. Uh, UV radiation causes skin cancer, sunburns in general, which aren't comfortable, and it can also affect female reproduction. So if you are living on the equator, you want to make sure that you have that protection from overexposure to UV radiation. And melanin is a natural sunscreen. So having a lot of melanin in one's skin is an adaptation to living in a particular part of the world. The reason why we see populations in the northern uh, latitudes and the very southern latitudes with less melanin is because it turns out we do need some UV radiation. UV radiation also uh, synthesizes vitamin D, which is important for strong and healthy bones. And up in these northern latitudes, there's a little bit less sunlight. It tends to be uh, rainier and cloudier, and so there's not as much UV radiation. Populations up here needed to lose some melanin so they can still synthesize vitamin D accordingly. What we see then, if we look at the world and this mapping of indigenous skin color or ancestral skin color, is that our skin color is perfectly adapted to where in the world our ancestors are from. If, however, we were to consider skin color as an indicator of race or subspecies affiliation, so what we're saying there is that physical characteristics group people by relatedness. That would mean that populations living here in equatorial Africa are more closely related to people in Peru and more closely related to people in Indonesia than they are to people living north or south of them in Africa. And that doesn't make any sense, right? If we use skin color to group people by race, then we suddenly see that this race does not reflect any sort of biological relatedness. So skin color is not entirely dependent on how closely humans are related to each other. So here's this spoiler, race, as long as race is defined by some physical characteristics, race is not biologically true. Race is a taxonomic system that has been created by humans. Okay, and so this just repeats what we were just talking about. Skin color is based on melanin, and melanin is enriched or depleted in an individual skin according to where in the world their ancestors uh, lived for long periods of time. And it turns out there is not a single physical characteristic that humans have that can be used to separate them into discrete groups. Not, uh, not eye color, not hair texture, not stature, not facial features. There's not a single thing that you can look at a human and say, if you have this characteristic, you are part of this race and you are not closely related to anything else. So physical characteristics cannot give us subspecies or race affiliation. The same is true of genes. We can't look at a person's genes and say, people with this gene are this race, people with this gene are this other race over here. We have so much genetic variation within populations, within breeding populations, because our genes have constantly been moving between these populations because of gene flow. So we can't even use something that's supposedly at the base of all of us to try to sort humans into these discrete groups. Therefore, we can say 
that biologically, there is no such thing as race. Race is something that has been created by humans. Race is one of the ways in which humans have attempted to classify themselves in relation to other people. It's a way of saying, we are this and you are that other thing. And often, race is dependent on some sort of physical characteristic like skin color, because that's what's really obvious to see, right? And especially hundreds of years ago, people weren't talking about genes. People didn't know there were things called genes. So it was those very overt physical characteristics that people used to separate themselves into groups. The racial classifications that we use today are based, uh, are based on the racial classifications that have been used historically, both in this country and elsewhere. But the racial classifications that are still used today are often very, very ethnocentric because they're created by some people to control others. So the racial classifications that are used today are based off of European classifications, uh, which were used to support the cultural superiority of European populations and to attempt to keep down other populations in the world that were being encountered. So in this sense, race, we can refer to it as a folk taxonomy. Um, it's a taxonomic system in that it's a way of classifying people, but it's a folk taxonomy, meaning that it doesn't have any basis in science. It doesn't have any basis in logic. It's something that has been used by particular people at particular times for some sort of cultural reasons. There's always some sort of cultural motivation behind it, and typically it's related to systems of power. So the, the concept of race, while not biological, it exists in this world today, but it exists as a social characteristic. It exists within a social system. And we continue relying on it because we think that it means something. But again, we're thinking that it means something, or people who rely on race in um, arguments, they believe that a person's race says something about their capabilities. So that's clearly a mistaken attribution to biology there. And when people make prejudgments about a person or about a person's abilities based on their race, that's called racism. So what we can see here is that there is not a biological truth to this concept of race, but it still retains a lot of meaning because people use it to negotiate power and have been using it to negotiate power and to discriminate for hundreds of years. So if we say then race doesn't exist, um, biologically race doesn't exist, does this mean that we can just forget about it and move on from the conversation and say, oh, we're living in a post-racial world and race isn't something that we need to worry about anymore? Well, not quite, because there are people who still believe in it very, very strongly. So while it might not be bi biological, the social importance of it is still there. But hopefully by breaking down what's social about race or what's cultural about race and what's biological about race, which is nothing, we can start to better deal with confronting and combating racism in the world today. As anthropologists, we no longer use race as an indicator of where someone is from or as a way of describing physical characteristics or physical variation within modern humans. Instead, we use the term ancestral groups because it is still important to talk about and it's still interesting to talk about the variation that exists because of where people have come from in the world, but we need to make sure that we don't continue to conflate the social with the biological.